He is a um, licensed clinical psychologist and also a professor of psychology in the clinical child and school psychology program at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. And today he's going to tell us about how, it reminds me a little bit of Adam Connor, um, pseudoscience ruins adolescence. <laughs> to be here, um, and as uh, it was inspired by having uh, Adam Ruins here earlier, so I uh, thought that would be a way to kind of spin my talk, uh, but I also have a subtitle for my talk, an alternative subtitle that I didn't originally submit, Sex, Drugs, and a Guinness World Record Goal, uh, because at the end of my talk I'll talk about an attempt we made, an official attempt to break a Guinness World Record related to one of our myths that we've been uh, working on. Uh, I have three teenagers, and so that also inspired this talk. And I this summer took a, a trip to Colorado, a road trip with the three teens, and uh, did get to experience how hard it is to be around three teens nonstop for a week. Uh, if you look at the one in the middle in particular, his eyes will pierce your soul, and he's not happy with what is happening during the trip. And because of that, I developed a few rules for myself during our trip to Colorado. So rules with traveling with teens, don't suggest to teens that an SUV provides plenty of room for a road trip. Don't suggest to teens that they look at the scenery instead of their devices. Don't neglect to find out if there's a fire ban at your campsite before you arrive. Fires are 95% of the camping experience, it turns out. Uh, don't take pictures of teens. <laughs> Don't enter selfies with teens. <laughs> Don't video yourself describing the fun you're having near teens, <laughs> e.g. vlogging. <laughs> Don't say cringy things, <laughs> e.g. vlogging. <laughs> Don't ask teens exactly what cringy means. <laughs> Don't start using the word cringy, because when you say cringy, that is actually very cringy. And don't let teens see you make list of rules. And you can probably, if you've been around teens, relate to my experience of why I decided to make this list of rules, because it is kind of fun uh, to uh, uh, realize how hard it is to be around teens, but it actually, Joking about teens like that kind of goes against one of my three major messages for the day. I've got three messages I wanted to get through today. One is that teens these days get a bad rap, which I kind of gave my teens a bad rap, but they did still kind of deserve it. And then, secondly, many ways we try to help teens these days do not work. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we do have some evidence-based based approaches to helping teens cope with the challenges in life. Uh, so, I wanted to open with this poll of adults uh, that survey teens these days, and you can see that 82% believe teens these days have less sense of morals than in the past. 74% believe teens are more reckless than in the past, and there are a whole bunch of other questions that were pretty similar that people have a pretty low opinion of, of teens these days. Uh, here's a quote from Aristotle uh, that shows us that people have always had kind of a low opinion of teens these days. But they're always worse than the teens of before. Uh, so Aristotle's quote, they are hot-tempered and quick-tempered and apt to give way to their anger. Bad temper often gets the better of them. And I think a lot of people would still describe teens that way these days. Uh, my colleague Dr. Jeremy Jewell and I conducted our own poll uh, we conducted a poll of college students to see what they thought about teens these days. And uh, we asked some, well, we, we gave them several statements, some we believe to be myths, and some were evidence-based approaches. I'm not going to share with you all of them, but I'll share with you some of the myths that we asked our participants about. Um, for example, and they weren't worded exactly like this, they were a little wordier, but basically this idea that adolescence is filled with turmoil or, or Adolescents, all adolescents experience this storm and stress period of life, and 82% of our sample endorsed that idea. Uh, teens these days are worse behaved than previous generations. Even 62% of our participants endorsed that belief. And the Scared Straight program, which uh, sends teens to prisons after they've committed some type of offense to get scared uh, so they learn they don't want to go to prison, 64% of our participants believe that was an effective program. Touching on each of those topics then a little bit, 
Uh, the, the storm or stress model, this idea that all adolescents experience extreme turmoil, was uh, largely first presented by Stanley Hall uh, in 1904. But um, if you look at teens these days, about 20% of them do experience pretty significant turmoil, but that means that's 80% of teens these days that actually describe their life experiences as pretty pleasant. Um, another point here is that 67% of teens have a secure relationship with their parents and actually feel pretty good about the relationship that they have with their parents. So teens these days are actually doing pretty good. If you look at juvenile arrest rates uh, over the last couple decades, this graph is from 1990 and uh, it goes up to 2014, you can see property crimes have been decreasing, violent crimes have been decreasing that teens are committing. Uh, and so things are actually moving in a, in a good direction for teens. Regarding the Scared Straight program that I mentioned, uh, I thought I'd just kind of present this one study, but there's several studies uh, that, that were done in the 80s looking at the Scared Straight program, and the data looks just like this across all of the different studies. It's not mixed results. They, they quite often look just like this, where they would randomly assign kids who committed some type of offense to a Scared Straight group or to a control group who did nothing, and the kids in the scare, and then they would look to see after they got scared straight or not, did they commit more offenses down the road? And you can see the kids who were in the scared straight group were considerably more likely to commit more offenses than the kids <laughs> in the control group. Uh, and so, oops. And so, as you can see, uh, not only is scared straight an ineffective program, uh, it's, hard, it's, it's it's a good chance the data shows it's actually harmful. It makes kids, for some reason, more likely to commit more crimes, but that didn't stop uh, what used to be the Scared Straight Academy Award winning documentary uh, to be kind of revisited with the Beyond Scared Straight television program uh, that luckily ended a couple years ago, but it's a pretty pretty recent show. Um, we also asked uh, a couple, we presented a couple statements about sex. Uh, one example is caring for an infant simulator doll increases teen abstinence. Uh, so <laughs> infant simulator doll, but these days a lot of kids will take home like a, this little doll, but it's like a computer chip inside, it's like a little robot baby, and you take it home for the weekend, and it cries, and you have to feed it, and then the computer chip keeps track of how good a job you did to take care of the baby, did you drop it, did you shake it, did you feed it when you were supposed to. Um, and part of the idea of that is that will make you not have sex because you don't want to have a baby, and 50% of our participants believe that was effective. Uh, most teens who take virginity pledges wait until they're married to have sex. 38% of our sample believe virginity pledges are effective. And uh, we presented this one, sexting is only a teen problem. And 78% of our sample believe sexting is only a teen problem. Now looking at each of those topics in a little more detail, we can see just like juvenile arrest rates have been on the decline, so have teen pregnancy rates. They've been declining from 1992, this goes up to 2015. The infant simulator doll, there's a picture of one, this one's called the baby think it over. Uh, it's also <laughs> ready or not tots. Uh, you can kind of see the back there, it's got the computer work that keeps track of how good a job you're taking care of. You can actually, the teacher in the class can set it to like an easy baby or a difficult baby. Uh, I don't know why you send them home with an easy baby if you're using this program, but you can. Um, but it's been researched quite a bit, and it, it, research never shows it actually changes behavior in teens. Uh, it might change some of their attitudes, but it never changes their sexual behavior. Regarding virginity pledges, research shows that the majority of kids who take virginity pledges still have sex before their marriage, before they're married. Uh, and so that shows us virginity pledges aren't terribly effective at reaching their goal. Regarding sexting, well, it's true. Uh, 10 to 15 percent of teens do engage in sexting, but the myth we presented was that it's only a teen problem, and so do 33 to 53 percent of adults, and quite a few get in big trouble for it, and you know who you are. <laughs> we also presented a few myths uh, and evidence-based statements related to drugs. Uh, from some examples, most teens party with drugs or alcohol on the weekends. 70% of our participants believe that. Uh, specialized goggles, also called fatal vision goggles, prevent <laughs> impaired driving. I'll talk about that more in a minute, but 54% believe that. And DARE programs prevent drug use. 40% believe that. So if you look at drug use uh, over, this is from 2001 to 2017, in teenagers, it's dropping substantially across all these different drugs. 
And then if you look at alcohol and cigarettes, it's also dropping quite a bit from 1991 to 2017. We don't have historical data on vaping, which is a relatively more modern phenomenon. Um, but I would say out of all the things listed up here, I think there's some research starting to show that is on the incline. Um, and so uh, something I'm hearing kids doing in our middle schools nearby. And so it's something, if I was going to worry about drugs and teens these days, vaping would be at the top of my list. Here's uh, the fatal vision goggles, or these goggles you wear. It alters your perceptual field, and it mimics the effects, some of the effects of being drunk. Uh, and then when you, DARE programs often use them, but other programs use them too. And then when you're wearing the goggles, you're supposed to walk a straight line, or in this case, these teams are riding on pedal carts, and it's supposed to make you realize how vulnerable you are when you're drinking and driving, and you can't do it that well. Uh, but if you look at their faces, they're actually pretty happy. <laughs> and so it probably makes their driving seem pretty fun. <laughs> Uh, even on my campus, somebody was doing this. They were having students wear uh, fatal vision goggles while they were playing volleyball, which is really hard to do, too, but a lot of fun. Uh, the D.A.R.E. program, from the beginning, D.A.R.E. has pretty much avoided doing their own research on their program, uh, but other people started researching it, and it, research continues to show D.A.R.E. is not a terribly effective prevention program, even though it's in the majority of school districts in America. But I think the bigger, more important issue is why does the mascot for D.A.R.E. not wear pants? <laughs> you would think if you were developing a mascot for your drug abuse prevention program, you would have them wear a responsible wardrobe. <laughs> so I did a deeper dive into this issue because it was bothering me. And what I discovered was that the original mascot for D.A.R.E. actually was not D.A.R.E. and the D.A.R.E. lion. It really was Yogi Bear. What? Yeah, the first spokes bear for D.A.R.E. And, uh, and he, you know, Yogi Bear famously doesn't wear pants. And they decided to stop paying Yogi Bear to be their spokes bear. And so they decided to stick with the no pants decision, though. So I thought that was fascinating. Yeah. So uh, some of my messages today, I already went over the, the teens these days get a bad rap, and I think I should give you some evidence for, for how, why they really don't deserve the bad rap that they always get. Uh, I gave you some examples of ways that we try to help teens that really are not effective. And just briefly wanted to mention, we do have some good evidence-based approaches to helping teens deal with these issues I've described. For example, comprehensive sex education programs that teach abstinence, but they also teach about contraception, are more effective than abstinence-only prevention programs. Life skills training is a prevention program for uh, drug use and alcohol use, and it has a pretty good amount of research support. And then multisystemic therapy, or MST, is an effective program for preventing additional acts of juvenile delinquency. We explored myths and evidence-based approaches in our books. Um, and in our first book, the Great Myths About Child Development book, we, debunked, we also debunked a myth about reading. And the myth we debunked was that most babies can learn to read with the right reading program. You might remember the Your Baby Can Read program. Uh, as it turns out, your baby cannot read. <laughs> and their false claims led to a $185 million settlement with the FTC. In our, uh, well, in, but rather than just debunking claims in our books, we wanted to do something, so we put out a call to action. We started collecting gently used books to give to children at the Head Start program that I work for. And there's over a thousand kids in the program. We collected from our community over a thousand gently used children's books and gave one book to every kid in our Head Start program with a note home to parents about literacy and ways to promote it and how the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends daily reading with kids starting from the age of birth. Uh, but you can see here's one of our book giveaways. Here's one of our book giveaways with all the kids. We got some local press for that, and we also won a free little library that we put on our Head Start, and kids can swap out the books that they were given with our free little library. In our second book, we also debunked a myth about reading, but the myth was that most teens hardly ever engage in leisure reading these days. Uh, research shows that about half of teens engage in leisure reading at least once a week, so they're still reading. Um, now, it is on the decline, though, so um, leisure reading is on the decline, so this is something I think it's reasonable to be a little worried about, that teens are reading less and less. Uh, for our new book, Greatness of Adolescence, which is coming out next month, and uh, 
Um, so we're excited about that. But we also wanted to kind of continue our tradition of trying to collect books and to give to, give away to kids. And so, as I mentioned, we tried a, uh, we had an official attempt for our Guinness World Record. I contacted Guinness, said, hey, we want to try to break one of your records. The record was the longest line of books placed on the ground, end to end. And I thought we could have a chance of breaking it. We tried to break it on International Literacy Day. The record we had to try to beat was 1.4 miles of books laid on the ground, and it included over 13,000 books. So uh, we had a lot of different people in our community donate loads and loads of books. Here's a bunch of boxes of our books and an exhausted student. Um, and for example, 1,500 books were, it came from teens and tweens in one of our middle schools. Over 60 people volunteered on the day, and most of them were, from, were emerging adults, aka college students, from the often maligned millennial generation. <laughs> And it took an entire day to lay down all the books that were donated. In fact, we didn't even have enough time to lay down all the books that were donated because it turns out it takes a really long time to lay down all these books. Uh, but we uh, laid them down. We couldn't let there be a single gap between any two books or it would ruin the, the record. But we also wanted to take up as much space as possible so you could see we put them diagonal so they would take a little extra space. I'm not a math guy, but I figured that out. Um, we have to pay a lot of money to Guinness for them to send their own judge, which we didn't want to do, so we had to come up with our own crew of people that could be our official witnesses, including a land surveyor, an accountant, a police lieutenant, and a lawyer. And then we also had a videographer video the attempt. Uh, and we did. We broke the Guinness World Cup. Yeah. Yeah. Quickly, so it took 49 weeks to get an answer from Guinness. 49 weeks. I ju we just found out in August of this year, and we did it in September of the previous year. But our line was 2.64 miles, over 21,000 books. We had 30,000 books, but we just ran out of time. It's just a lot of books to lay down. Uh, this time we got a shout out in the New York Times for celebrating International Literacy Day in a quirkier way. Uh, we donated the books to several places, including a charter high school juvenile detention center, and we continue to donate to the Head Start program. But last year, instead of one book for every kid, we gave five books to every kid in our Head Start program. So that's 5,000 books, so that was exciting. <laughs> uh, we still have more to give away. Um, we also used the book giveaways to encourage daily reading, which I mentioned, and a specific type of reading with kids called print referencing, which helps speed up their literacy process. Uh, and we learned that a Guinness World Record attempt is a great way to give adults, tweens, teens, emerging adults, and the rest of us a little extra motivation to work toward a great goal. I want to thank uh, some of the people that helped with the Guinness World Record attempt, my co-authors on the books, uh, and the series editors, and then lastly, my mom, Deanna Hupp, who's dedicated her life to promoting literacy in children, and then my fiance, Farah, who is at her very first skeptical conference today. Yeah.